the Hobbs also. Well, we're, we're all doing very, very well and uh, getting ready to travel up to Worcester to cover a Red Sox um, event uh, celebrating Jackie Robinson. I can't wait to go and bring that information back. Oh, interesting. Jackie Robinson, huh? Yeah, because I know that supposedly in a year or two they're going to have a, a minor league team up there that's building a stadium up there, so. That's the, right. It's the it's the Red Sox and the minor league, and they're just celebrating Jackie Robinson's birthday. And we had a, a friend who talked with the Red Sox, and they have asked if we would come and cover it, and we're mm-hmm. going to make the trip. Well, it sounds like Wiss is ahead of the game <laughs> over Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Probably right. Yeah, they know what's up. Twenty twenty is going to be big. So anyhow. Um, Start off as usual here at the Black Power Hour, sponsored by your Black Community Information Center here at Boston Praise Radio and TV. And I just wanted to, I had another uh, animated discussion yesterday at a meeting there, Pastor Wall, around, quote-unquote, uh, cannabis. And so, of course, uh, we talked about uh, what cannabis meant for black folk in the past, you know, referred to as reaper and weed and a lot of folks went to prison um, based on selling it uh, vis-a-vis the alleged war on drugs so it was really interesting because uh, I was talking you know it was a meeting and we had of course we had some younger folks there and so the of course there's been a big propaganda push as it pertains to uh, the cannabis industry uh, being an economic engine for the community. Now, of course, we all know that it was weed and reefer uh, years ago when it directly affected our community around imprisonment and what have you. But now it's given a sophisticated name of cannabis because of the fact that, uh, well, first of all, the whole opioid uh, piece is going on that's affecting uh, the white community. And plus the fact that uh, they say it, it's something that... Uh, they can do from an economic perspective. Now, as I've stated before in the past, um, I'm anti-cannabis. Uh, and only uh, exception would be uh, as it pertains to someone who has a medical condition, say they're in pain or what have you, and they can get some relief. Otherwise, uh, I'm against having what I call pot shops uh, in our community. But what I thought was very interesting was uh, some of the uh, comments made by some of the younger folks, the younger generation, and talking about uh, cannabis as an industry and uh, talking about, uh, don't forget that in terms of coming up with the final uh, product, that there are other smaller uh, companies that are involved that provide some of the ingredients, what have you. And so it was really interesting that it's really been given a uh, very uh, sophisticated uh, presentation, if you will, as it, as it pertains to uh, putting the cannabis issue out there. And so young folks, you know, they can break it down in terms of the whole industrial uh, piece, but I said the bottom line for me is still uh, it alters your state of mind and if it all, we as particularly black people, based on our situation out here, we cannot afford to have our, our state of mind uh, altered. Now, the irony is that recently it was announced that you know there were some individuals who wanted to open a liquor store up in the Grove Hall area, and of course <laughs> it was up to me all liquor stores to be shut down. But evidently. Folks came together, some organizations and residents, and the individuals who were looking to open the liquor store, they were applying for a license, uh, pulled back and was uh, claimed as a victory for the community, which it was. What I don't understand, though, is uh, we've been informed that uh, a couple of brothers intend to open up, evidently they've been given uh, licensing to open up a quote-unquote pot shop in Grove Hall, and I haven't heard anything at all, I don't know if you have, Pastor Wall, uh, 
in terms of folks being in opposition to this pot shop being now we got you know school right down the street uh, a lot of our young folks come through Grove Hall it's a commercial district and so I'm just kind of uh, I should say I'm appalled that there's no opposition to this pot shop uh, I don't know if you've heard anything about that at all Pastor Wall, no, but not about Grove Hall I know that there was a move afoot to put a pot shop here in Cobbin Square and there, I, I received no notification. The church didn't receive a no- notification about the first meeting, so I missed that. Then they had a notification about the second meeting. I was going. That meeting was canceled. And then I heard that the meeting was put back on, but we received no notification, and they had the second meeting. So uh, I, I don't know what's going on. I just have been too busy to pursue the city to find out who I need to speak to. Well, I know that folks, I know folks, they said, well, you know, they have a pot shop in Brookline, and uh, they mentioned a couple of other spots in, in the suburbs, but they're minimal. But it seems like, now you're talking, I didn't even know about the Carbon Square deal. Oh, yeah. It, they, you know, they just want to inundate our community with these, <laughs> with these pot shops. Because, you know, I've got Grove Hall, and then I got wind of the fact that there, there's talk of some interest by some individuals to open up a shop in Nubian Square. Wow. And wow. And and is my understanding there was a shop opening up right across the street from McDonald's on American Legion Highway. So we're being inundated with these shops. And and what gets me is now like former city councilor Tito Jackson when he was a city councilor he was against uh these pot shops and the cannabis uh, piece. But now he's the, the front man for a company in Florida that's trying to get a shop set up in Mattapan. There are folks vying for a shop in Mattapan. Mm. And Andrea Cabral, who worked with Governor Patrick, she, in fact, uh, my understanding is that she's setting up uh, a shop that's going to be opening up in the seaport. I know I was, I was surprised to hear that about the seaport, but uh, it's just an interesting phenomenon the way uh, it seemingly it's gone 360, but when you look, uh, you look at Mattapan, you said uh, Cardman Square, uh, you said American Legion, uh, down there, um, proposed, because you know, I can tell you right now, there'll, there'll be opposition in Nubian Square to it because of the fact that <laughs> we don't need it there. But uh, we shall see what's going to happen with this whole piece. For those who don't believe that um, there's a certain conspiracy to see to it that a number of these shops are in our community, it's for a reason. And I say to folks, well, and let me just say this, uh, Pastor Wall, I was at the event at the bowling building in Newman Square when uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley was there with some other sisters who were in the Black Caucus. And the person who was emceeing was, you know, Boston City Councilor Kim Janey. And she made the statement, and I was like, what? She made the statement that cotton was the uh, industry of our enslavement, but cannabis is the, in- is the uh, industry of our, in fact, uh, freedom, if you will. Yeah. And I'm, I'm saying emancipation. That was the term she used, emancipation. And I just sat there and I said I couldn't believe what was being said. And in this this world of technology, and you know we've we've got young people out here that are doing some good things that we're just not aware of that's going on. And I would hope that particularly like with uh, Nubian Square and Grove Hall Carbon, that you know they're going to come out out of the woodwork, if you will and come together and open up some of these businesses that we so sorely need that fit within the realm of where things are going technologically now. And that doesn't mean having our folks set up their houses um, because of the fact that uh, a couple of young people talked about yesterday about how cannabis has a different effect on you than liquor. And I said, anything that you, in fact, put in your system, and it alters your state of mind, whether it's liquor or cannabis we don't need it so I would hope because I keep talking about how it's a, a multi-billion dollar industry and it's you know it's just disturbing that we're looking at that as being a particular
particular economic engine for our community when there are many other options we can do with that. All right, the Tubman House. Well, we all know what's happening with that, that uh, there was some controversy because of the fact that evidently the board at the Tubman House down there at Columbus and Mass have voted to, in fact, approve a sale to a developer for the building that, that uh, presently exists to be torn down and be replaced by condos and commercial space from the bottom floor. And uh, I guess a few unit, units of housing would be available for artists. But uh, I just saw something recently where evidently an individual has uh, filed a lawsuit um, to uh, fend off the sale. But I think it's really important to note that um, it's it's not going to delay the inevitable. It's a done deal. When you've got the board of directors and the city and the developers all in the same room, and this is not, it's not a recent uh, phenomenon. This has been worked on for many, many months. So when they came out and announced, they had already cut a deal. So I'm not saying that it's a matter of, well, just giving up. But the reality is that uh, it's been finalized. It's not going to be reversed by the court. And that folks who are out here and active, they need to be putting their energy into uh, activities that are going to be uh, much more productive for us and moving forward. So I applaud those who have put, you know, put some time and energy into it. But uh, for myself, uh, the Tubman House, which in many respects is not sitting in the heart of our community anymore. Anyhow, um, should not, we you know we've got a lot of other um, situations we need to look into. And I'll be talking about Newton Square soon because of all the development that's going to be coming there and what we have to do as a community. And the NAACP convention uh, is coming here July 20th to July 25th this summer. And uh, I still haven't heard anything at all about what the plans are. Uh, we're talking about six months from now, having a major convention coming here. And I've mentioned this before in the Black Power Hour. Coming here to the city of Boston, they're saying a minimum of 15,000 people. And I, I've just, uh, I discussed this with you last week, past the wall. I've talked to some folks who are, I would say, major players out here in, in the uh, world of contractors or what have you, vendors and what have you. Uh, and they said that they really haven't gotten any type of outreach as it pertains to what the plans are. So I would hope that the uh, Boston branch of NAACP is going to be... Because someone said to me that uh, they have their monthly meetings, but with a, an event of this magnitude coming to the city of Boston, seemingly uh, there would be uh, more than just a monthly meeting in terms of, I'm sure they're planning, but just to update the community so that uh, folks can be informed and understand you know, what the opportunities are, like, Boston Praise Radio and TV should have in your position right now all the information to share with the community about who they need to reach out to to find out about this convention and what the opportunities are. But uh, right now, uh, there's just silence. And I I know I ask you every week, uh, Pastor Paul, well, have you heard anything at all? I mean, you know, Boston Praise Radio and TV. <laughs> have you heard anything? No, we are, uh, are not in that loop uh, again. Um Tanisha was on Mamlio's broadcast two weeks ago and talked about some of the contracts that were being made available to different vendors, and I was hoping that we would be one of those vendors, but nothing has happened yet, so I'm standing by. Unfortunately, when you go to people and you ask them to be a vendor or you ask them if you can be a part of what, what it is that uh -huh. they're doing, because you go to them they they don't give you lucrative contracts because you're you're going to them uh when they come to you and they ask you they're, they're validating what you have to offer and then you know you charge them the going rate so we'll see we'll see we're we're here and we're ready well i hope something comes to the surface soon because six months 
that's you know that's not <laughs> a lot of time. That's not. It'd be one thing if we're talking about 2021. We're six months away and no information. I know at the Black Community Information Center, we've kind of reached out and we've been told uh, we'll get back to you. You know what I mean? So I said, okay. Firing. All right. Uh, Mayor Walsh uh, has announced that. In June, the King Cut uh, Memorial or whatever statue is going to be coming back to the city of Boston. And I think it's really interesting because what's going on now uh, with Nubian Square and the Nubian Exhibit, all of a sudden Africa is all over the city of Boston. And I, what, what was interesting to me, though, is that when I read the article, uh, in the Globe, uh, they said it was a a 25-foot black and gold structure that's going to be down there at the, I guess we used to call it the old castle down there at Park Square on exhibit starting in uh, June. And what was really uh, amusing to me was that they described it as a black and gold statue rather than saying that it was a statue uh, of a black man who, in fact, had on, <laughs> there was gold <laughs> that was on the statue of a black man. They don't want to talk about the fact that King Tut was a black man, an Egyptian, and that the, in terms of the uh, original people in Egypt, in fact, on this earth, it's us. And so I just thought that it was interesting for them to say that uh, it was a 25-foot black and gold statue. Now, I think that if, in fact, King Tut were white, I don't think that they would have said that it was a a 25-foot white and gold statue. They would have made it very clear that uh, King Tut was a white man and that this was just, you know, the gold was part of the adornment there. So just don't want to give us any credit at all. Just don't want to give us any credit at all. So folks need to understand the fact that uh, this quote-unquote black and gold statue is a statue of a black man who led an empire many centuries ago in Egypt. So when you talk to your children about it, make sure that they're aware of the fact that King Tut is a black man. And while we're talking about King Tut, Museum of Fine Arts, of course, you know, they had a real problem uh, last spring when students from the Davis uh, Academy Charter School went over there. Uh, They faced a certain amount of uh, discrimination. And, of course, it was out there in the media. uh, A lot of talk was about the fact about how disgraceful how uh, these young people were treated. So the Museum of Fine Arts has been on the defensive, and so they've been looking for ways to uh, recover their image, if it will, whatever that image was. And so I know that I was at one of Mel King's brunches uh, several months ago, and a woman who I did not know approached me and said that uh, the person who was in charge of the exhibit at the time, which had, you know, had there was only a minor display at the time, wanted to talk to me about the campaign uh, for Nubian Square. And so, never met with that person. I really wasn't interested. And folks don't understand the fact that all those artifacts in the museum are stolen artifacts from Africa. And evidently they were in the uh, basement of the museum for like a hundred years and <laughs> it was donated by uh, this individual who was a known white racist. But anyhow, uh, there was a young lady, her, her name was Teresa. In fact, she lived here. She passed away some years ago, but she lived here at the uh, Piano Craft Building. And she was the one who, she was into the weaving art. And she, in fact, is the one who, you know, I, I know she had a contract with the museum 
museum and said, well, you need to bring this exhibit out of the basement. And so she's not getting the credit that she's due. But uh, she was the prime motivator from the beginning. So what it is is that the exhibit has been over there uh, for some months now. And the last day was yesterday, the 20th, on the King holiday. And so what it is is that uh, I had a block of tickets. We gave away part of them uh, during Kwanzaa. And so I went to go over there yesterday to finally get there. And past the wall, when I got there, and, and only for the exhibit, of course, you know, I think it was free, whatever, uh, the King holiday. And when I got there, uh, the line was out the door and onto Huntington Avenue. Now, if it had been summer, I might have said, well, look, I'll just be patient with it. But it was cold out there. I said, well, I'm just going to Google the exhibit because of the fact that I was not going to wait in that line to, as much as I wanted to see that exhibit. But I think it's interesting that because uh, a couple of folks have put out, out there on Facebook about, you know, Roxbury was represented. And so it, it appears that in many respects, the museum was using the momentum from my campaign to help them as it pertains to getting the turnouts they've been getting. But also, uh, it's been helpful to our campaign because of the fact that uh, more and more black folk now are inquiring about uh, Nubia, the Nubian Empire, based on the fact that they know now that uh, the family shopping district would be uh, Nubian Square. So it's just interesting to see the way uh, folks are rolling right now. And all of a sudden, Africa is becoming a focal point here in the city with the King Tut uh, statue, uh, the Nubian exhibit at the museum, and now we have Nubian Square. And so what it is, is it's very clear that what's going on politically is that with Boston still having the reputation of being the most racist city, in the country, that there's an effort being led by the Wall Street administration to try to to take down uh, some of that image by promoting uh, this African image, if you will, with everything that's going on. So, I mean, it's, it's, for me, it's all good because uh, our young people are learning a lot right now. They're doing research about the Nubian Empire, and hopefully parents will be taking them down to see the... Uh, the King Tut statues when that happens. So, um, you know, it, it works out on both ends. It works out, It works for us in terms of the fact that we want our young folks to be proud of their African heritage. And then at the same time, um, although I don't know if it's going to have any effect as it pertains to the image that the city has, because when you talk about Boston, you talk to anybody outside the city, the same response comes that their understanding is that Boston is still a very racist city, which it is in many, many respects, so we shall see what happens. But I think it's, it's interesting with everything that's what's going on. Did you get a chance to get over to the exhibit there, um, Pastor Wall? No, I haven't. I have not. I have not. Um, I actually did. don't recall much information about it, and if I heard it once or twice, it didn't stick. My understanding is that uh, the full uh, exhibit is not going to be up there anymore, but that there's still going to be an exhibit over there for folks who want to get over there and check it out. They said that the one that uh, ended yesterday had over like 400 pieces. And, uh, you know, it's not going to have the same number but for those who want to get over there. But like I said before, we have to understand the fact that, that this is a, uh, stolen art from Africa and that uh, we need to understand that when we, you know, this is not an act of generosity when we get a chance to in fact uh, observe that this, this belongs to us, it belongs to our ancestors and it's put on display for us to see and uh, we should own it, if nothing else it should be sent back to its rightful owners, that's my perspective Alright, um, I was at Black Market, down there in Nubian Square this past Saturday, they did kind of like a, 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 a talk, uh, it was a, a discussion session about, it was uh, described as uh, Nubian Square, now what? And Sister uh, Kaidi, Kaidi and her husband there who run Black Market, they ran it uh, for folks to be able to 
to have a, a discussion about uh, what's going to happen now with the square, and that's really important because of the fact that there has to be economic development there because the name change alone is, is not going to be uh, the engine, if you will, that's necessary to see to it that uh, that's a, a pr- productive area for our community. So there was, a, you know, there was a wide range of folks there. Uh, I did the initial presentation about the history of the Newland Square Coalition, and then folks basically, you know, were able to uh, make comments and do presentations as of what it would take uh, for uh, that to happen. And so I, I was really encouraged because of the fact, you know, there was young people there, and there was discussion among them about what they would like to see happen. Seemingly, uh, there is there's going to be some. Well, we already know there's going to be uh, development that's going on there because of the fact that there are six or seven parcels that uh, are designated for for development down there. Uh, we'll talk about, well, what's up a bit right now is the uh, Blair's parking lot, but then you have uh, the uh, what was the Harrison Supply hardware uh, location there right across from Goodwill. Um, that uh, piece there has been purchased by the Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology, and they're, in fact, moving their campus there. Um, I'm assuming they're going to start on it very soon because they've, they've made <laughs> the final purchase, if you will, in terms of that being a designated spot, and they've actually started talking about it. Then you've got the Haley House, their parking lot and their facility, um, Haley House somehow is going to be in the package of getting some rehab done with their facility, but there's going to be housing, commercial development. Then where One United Bank is located, where the buses come in, uh, Long Bay Management is supposed to be doing, they want to do a 26-story tower. There's been some controversy because of the fact that there's been questions about its size and also uh, the number of affordable units that, that are going to be in there, if at all. Then right next to uh, the library that's being uh, rehabbed, it's getting a $20 million rehab, and right next to it where the B-2 police station used to be, um, John Cruz Company has been designated, and they're going to be building some housing there and commercial development. So there's a lot going on in the square right now, and uh, we have to be on top of it. Now, as I've mentioned in the past, you know, the Black Community Information Center, um, you know, there's, there's a national movement that's been going on for the last few years to take down the names of individuals, you know, who there are symbols and monuments honoring them, and they, in fact, were involved in the slave trade. And so even before this movement started several years ago, uh, we led the effort at the Information Center to have Washington Park renamed Malcolm X Park and New Dudley Street. Malcolm X Boulevard, and subsequently, after uh, achieving those two goals, we moved on to Dudley Square, and said to the community, we need to take down that name Dudley, so of course we spent a couple of years educating folks, but they were asking, well, why would you want to take down the Dudley name? Well, because they were involved in the slave trade. Uh, Thomas Dudley was a governor, and in 1641, law was passed legalizing slavery, in Massachusetts, so Massachusetts was the first colony, if you will, to actually legalize slavery. And then later on down the line, his son Joseph became governor and maintained that status. Then in the 1700s, led by the abolitionists, uh, the law was taken down. So we just felt that it was a major contradiction to have our primary commercial shopping district named after the slave and wall family. So after almost six years, we had a uh, ballot question for the November 5th, 2019 election, and 16 precincts were designated to make the final decision. They were all in close proximity to the square, and they voted overwhelmingly to have the name change from Dudley Square to Nubian Square. And uh, what it is is that we arrived at that name because of the fact that we want to have something that basically embraced all of the black and brown population.
population in, uh, in the area, and we felt that that was appropriate because whether you're from Haiti or from Harvard Street um, in Dorchester, you know, you in fact could relate to that name because we are Nubian people. Then under 719, you know, that was a non-binding question, so what the vote was not binding. We wanted to be a permanent name, so we went to, uh, did a presentation before the Public Improvement Commission on, this, uh, on December 19th, and at which time Boston Parade Radio and TV was present, not only present, but uh, in fact, Pastor Wall, I'm getting ready to put out a summary about what's happened up to this point in the video that you did, that Boston Praise Radio TV is going to be an attachment for folks to be able to see what the proceedings were. But the commission, they voted unanimously to make the name permanent, and so now we have uh, Nubian Square. So that's the first step from our perspective. And I should mention the fact that based on the enormous uh, amount of support that we were getting, that's how the uh, Nubian Square coalition evolved uh, out of the Black Community Information Center. So we had mosques, churches, black businesses, neighborhood associations, you know, a petition with over 2,000 names, just you name it in terms of folks being in support of having uh, Nubian Square. And so now, like I said before, that's just the first step, the name change. Now we have to continue the work. We want to uh, we we'll have a, a meeting. We're going to be meeting with State Rep. China Tyler in the very near future because of the fact that um, we're talking about her promoting a bill to change the name of Dudley Station, which comes under the MBTA to Nubian Station. And we're also in conversation with the friends of Dudley Library because we told them, why would you want to have the Dudley Library in Nubian Square, that would be a definite uh, contradiction to have the name of slave owners there in a square that, in fact, is named after uh, a thriving, ancient, ancient thriving African empire. So we're going to be looking to put the energy behind this whole process uh, to see to it that those changes are made, but most importantly, you know, with the gentrification that's going on, that uh, we want to pull together the neighborhood associations that are in the area, because, you know, there's, there's a turf thing with them in, t in terms of they're, they're, in fact, doing what's necessary to protect the turf, and we're saying to them that in some form or fashion, y'all need to come together as a coalition and unite because of the fact that the gentrification forces are strong out here, and to fend them off, there has to be a united effort. Like what's going on down there in Chinatown. They've got a problem down there with gentrification, but they, they're coming, to, coming together. Well, they come together on a regular basis strong, but they're really strong now about the uh, anti-gentrification piece that they're working on. And so uh, we would hope that uh, that's going to... Uh, come to fruition as it pertains to the neighborhood associations coming together. And uh, I know, uh, Pastor Wall, I was talking to some folks recently, and they had mentioned something to the effect that there were some folks up there um, in your area talking about um, changing the name of the square there. Is that, have you heard anything about that? I mentioned it to a gentleman... We were talking about Cobbin Square, and uh -huh. I pointed out the name and gave him the history, and he even knew more about the history than I read about. And so I said it would be interesting to see if this name could be changed, but there may have to be a dialogue with the people in the church. And um, I don't know where it was supposed to go from there, but there was a dialogue. Uh -huh. But it was in the street. We weren't sitting down formally talking to some of the key players there. Yeah, well, we're, we're hoping that um, the Nuba Square piece, you know, has a snowball effect, particularly with young folks. Right. Because, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, Dudley, Codman, you've got Ruggles, Washington, Columbus. I mean, just there's so many of these names that, that need to come 
ground. And I just tell young people that uh, they have to pick up the ball on this. I know there were some young folks the other day who were talking to me saying they were interested in the possibility of trying to take down the name Dudley Street. And I said, well, <laughs> I said, well hey, you know, if, if that's where your energy is, go for it. Right. Uh, Dudley Street is lengthy. But also I'm going to be interested just for, I know one of the things there, Pastor Wall, is that, you know, you have the Dudley Grill and uh, Dudley Cafe down there. And so what it is is that the young man who's, well, at present, uh, it hasn't officially changed, but it's going to be changed to the Nubian Square Main Street. And the brother now who's the president of the board, um, he acknowledged the fact that what I presented was that evidently the mayor's office said that they're willing to assist any businesses with the name down, it would change, you know, economic around signage or whatever, if they, in fact, so did I. They aren't, man, you know, they aren't mandated to do that, but we would hope that businesses that have that name will, in fact, uh, want, to, want to take it down and uh, put up uh, the new name that's there right now. So, you know, everything is a, it's a work in progress. But right. The one thing that uh, I'm, re- I'm really... Uh, excited about is that there seems to be an air of uh, optimism and folks looking at opportunity in the square because I know you know uh, even even on the air at Boston Praise Radio when folks talk when they talk about down Dudley there's like this there's no energy there and it's almost like the extent that why would I would want to be at Dudley you know, you know what I'm saying yeah, Pastor Wall just yeah. because of the reputation it has but now with Nubian Square like I said, I was really encouraged by the number of folks who were in that line over there at the museum. But I hear young people, and there's a certain amount of exuberance in their voice when they start talking about Nubian Square, like this was a new day, a new beginning, what have you. So um, I hope that that's, that's going to be what happens and that it's going to spread because of the fact that I, I explained to folks that although it was the folks in the immediate area uh, who voted, overwhelmingly to, in fact, change the name, that the energy from this campaign goes from Mass Ave to Mattapan. A lot of folks were involved who assisted with this, who came from different areas of the community to want to see this happen. So that's why we said it was a community victory, not just for folks down there in the immediate area of the square itself. So we would hope that uh, we can build off of that as it pertains to not only around the name change, but a lot of other uh, issues that we need to deal with as, as, as black and brown folks in the community. All right, uh, let's see what we've got here nationally. Well, first of all, let me mention uh, Charles Barkley. Now, he's a former professional basketball player. Uh, he factors in the... Um, National Basketball, Bas- National Basketball Association Hall of Fame, and you know he's now uh, uh, an announcer for games uh, that are played uh, during the season. And so, Charles Barkley has had kind of a reputation of being a uh, quote unquote somewhat of a buffoon with some of his positions, like you know, like he was like a supporter of uh, W. Bush. He's He's really made some bizarre comments to the extent I said, man, I said, I can't even listen to this dude talk. But past the wall, uh, I just read an article recently where uh, he donated a million dollars to, uh, I think it's Payne College in Alabama, historically black college. And I said, oh, wow, I said, that's amazing. But then come to find out that he's done it to three other black colleges. So he's given up a total of uh, $4 million to black colleges. And so what it is is that what gets highlighted out here is that he had a gambling uh, problem and blew a lot of money gambling. And so, of course, that only contributed to the buffoon image that was out there. But I think it's really important to note that in spite of everything that this brother was conscious enough to, in fact, donate $4 million to black colleges, which is more than I can say for a lot of folks out there who are in sports and entertainment, who they go out there and buy 18 cars and buy a multi-million dollar uh, mansion and what have you. So I thought it was important to mention the fact that Charles Barkley has taken 
four million dollars of his money to donate to black colleges. So, hey, uh, his image isn't that great. But when you do something positive, hey, you got to speak on it. You got to speak on it. All right, Dory Miller. Now, I know for a lot of young folks, they say, well, who's Dory Miller? Well, first of all, um, he was born uh, Doris Miller. And they're saying the reason what happens, how he ended up with the name Dory is because of the fact that uh, the Miller family, they thought that uh, they were going to have a girl. <laughs> and they actually had a boy. This is back in the back in uh, what late 20s. Uh, early 30s. Anyhow, they called him Dory Miller, and so he was serving on a, a U.S. Navy destroyer when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Now, of course, at that time, they didn't allow black men to, in fact, uh, carry weapons. You know, that whole racism thing that was going on. So, so he was on the ship and working in the ship's kitchen. So what happened was that the Japanese, when they attacked, the captain was uh, fatally wounded, and a lot of others were killed. And so what Dory Miller did was, he went and manned a machine gun and uh, proceeded to shoot down uh, a few of the Japanese plane, planes. Now, of course, uh, as per usual, he got no recognition because he was a black man, you know, no awards, no medals, no nothing. So finally down the line, he did get some recognition. And relatedly, uh, I think it was in the uh, 80s that, of course, he had passed away. But the medals that he deserved uh, were given to his family. Well, now they've announced that a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier is going to be named the USS Dory Miller. So, but lately, uh, he's getting the accolades that he deserves. But I think it's significant that uh, there's going to be a ship named after Dory Miller, the same they've announced upon uh, the congressman, uh, John Lewis, who in fact is suffering from the cancer. So I just thought that I'd like to bring that up so that maybe there's some young folks who are listening in at Boston Praise Radio and TV and would want to look up the history of Dory Miller because we as black people have fought for this country since the Revolutionary War still heavily discriminated against. And uh, cause I, I remember <laughs> reading something one time about how German prisoners of war, once they were captured, were treated better than the black troops. And so we put our blood out here for many, many centuries in terms of since the very beginning of this country. And still we're out here now just fighting for our basic civil slash human rights. So just thought that it was important to mention Dory Miller and the role that he played uh, during the attack on Pearl Harbor. And slowly but surely, uh, more and more inf information is coming to the surface about the, the role that uh, we as black people played as it, as it pertains to, quote-unquote, uh, protecting this country. Well, we've got the Trump impeachment. I believe, I believe, is it start today, Pastor Wall? It is on right now as we speak. Uh, very interesting. And uh, I've been checking out sporadically and uh, just looking at um, what's been going on and the division between the quote-unquote Republicans and the Democrats. And what amazes me is that I don't understand, particularly with the Black Hawk and all the energy that's going to look, the bottom line is that the final outcome was already predestined. Now, the House voted for him to be put on trial for possible impeachment.
said it right off, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. And the bottom line is that they are not going to vote for his impeachment. And so what I tell people is that you just need to prepare your mind and yourselves to understand the fact that Trump is going to be reelected. And for folks who don't find that to be believable, I remember when I predicted he was going to get elected previously, folks have said that will never happen. Well, he's in the position, and it seems like the worse he acts, the further entrenched he gets in the <laughs> in the presidency in terms of his, his poll numbers are up. Have you noticed that, Pastor Wall? <laughs> yeah, crazy. It really is. You know, he has no respect for women whatsoever. None. But when he got elected, he got almost 60% of the vote from white females. And so, you know, we don't understand what he represents. First of all, that, and I've mentioned this before here at uh, the Black Power Hour, is that white people all over the world are, right now, they're paranoid because they see their numbers going down, that there's more of them dying than are being born. And so they're in fear that they're heading towards extinction. And so when you've had someone saying, make America great again, and of course they've already said, you know, make America white again, they see Trump as their hero and the person that they can, in fact, stand behind as they try to fight off what they consider to be their possible extinction down the line. And so let's not fool ourselves uh, and I think it's really interesting. Um, I think they had like uh, at least 14 or 15 candidates initially in the Democratic Party. I think it's down to six. And you look at the six who debated now, I don't see anyone that looks like us. So who will it be this time? Will it be Biden? Uh, I can't. I never can pronounce this guy the the gay guy. I don't think he's gonna get the black vote anyhow. Yes, yes. I, I don't think he's going anywhere. So then you've got uh, who's the guy from Vermont there? Past the wall. I always forget. It. Bernie. And then the, the, the Massachusetts senator there, the Elizabeth. Woman. So it's, yeah, it's down to those choices. Yeah. So who who are you leaning toward? I am not excited about any of them. I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. So, once again, we're putting all this energy into how these individuals, and none of them who, in the terms of the bottom, bottom line, are going to do anything to benefit black people. So, we need to be looking inwardly as it pertains to what do we have to do for ourselves, just like every other group. And that's not about being uh, selfish. It's the reality of both human and whatever you do for you is in the best interest of us. So uh, I think that's where we, we need to be leaning. But uh, folks, we put a lot of energy into it. And for the life of me, I, I don't know, well, we know who's a Kamala Harris. I was glad to see when she went down in there because I, I think that she was uh, just a white woman pretending she was black. And then you had the uh, the brother there who was the senator from Newark. He's gone. So anybody that looks like us, they're gone anyhow. Not that it would have made a difference if they got in office. So. But it doesn't matter because uh, be prepared for President Trump. He's going to be right where he's at right now. All this impeachment stuff is theater. Nothing but theater. All right. Dr. King assassination. Well, I've been, I don't know, for me it's really kind of frustrating. I think I've mentioned before that in terms of the Black Community Space Center, for up, up to 20 years now since we found out about the trial in 1999 in Memphis, you know, with the King family not believing that James Earl Ray was assassinated, they had the civil trial in Memphis, and the jury came back with a verdict that Dr. King was the victim of assassination due to a conspiracy by agencies of the U.S. government. So in, two, two, in the year 2000, uh, we at the Black Information Center, we've been sending out information 
to various presidents like Clinton and W. Bush and Obama saying you need to establish a special grand jury to investigate, apprehend, and prosecute those guilty of the assassination. We didn't expect any results from that, but in terms of putting that information out there, at least the conversation has changed where it's gone from James O. Ray to accepting the fact, and when I say accepting, I mean the reality that it was a conspiracy by the U.S. government. But as I've mentioned in the past here at Boston Praise Radio and TV and others, that the frustration is that we thought that black folk would really stand up once they got the truth. I mean, you can go to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Assassination Trial Transcript dot com, and it lays out all the information about who was guilty of perpetrating this crime with the assassination of Dr. King. And here we are, twenty years later, after putting all this information, and black folk are still acting like they wanted to go away. Now I know they they had the breakfast. They had breakfasts all across the country, and then you see folks standing at the monument and talking about the dream. I mean, that wasn't really him. What really got him assassinated was when he started telling, telling black people that you started to need to do for yourself. Put your money in your black banks. And let's see what we got to do for ourselves, plus the criticism of the Vietnam War. That's what got him killed. But really, what really frustrates me past the wall is, look, uh, I really uh, respect that black man because he gave his life for black people. But it's hard for me to, in fact, get out here in a celebratory mood in his honor, knowing that his assassins are still out there walking the streets. The black people act like they're afraid of it, and they don't want to deal with it. And so what happens is that you look at all these breakfasts and ceremonies, and it's clear that folks are just going through the motions. That's all they're doing. And if they really cared about and respected Dr. King and his family, that they would be all up on this on this case. Members, Ayanna Presley brought some members of the Black Caucus here last week, and they were at Northeast, and I went over there, and they were talking about economic development, and I brought up the issue of the assassination, and was the Black Caucus, which is made up of 54 individuals, were they going to take on this case and pursue justice? And past the wall, they looked at me like they had fear in their eyes. Mm. Uh, it's it's just it's amazing to me that we have all this information: who the shooter was, the circumstances, everything's out there for the public consumption, and we do nothing about it. You got Israel; they're out here pursuing hundred-year-old former Nazis and putting them in jail, and here we are with this icon, this black man that gave up his life for us knowing who, in fact, perpetrated this crime. And we do nothing about it. Now, I, don't, I know you've heard me put it out there many times, uh, Pastor Wall. Do you think that I'm wasting my time or just let it go? I mean, I, I, black folk just frustrate me. I, I, I'm, I'm in the same place with you as it relates to going to these events because I don't usually see these people. I haven't seen these people in the streets, or some of these people were not supporting Dr. King when he was engaged, uh-huh. and I, I find a lot of, uh, and, and again, I couldn't, because I haven't been, uh, maybe I haven't been seeing a lot of stuff, but it seems like a lot of people, uh, corporate people would be sending their corporate folk just to go to the event. Yeah. You know, there's there's no real movement. There's, there's no. I, I need to be a part of a movement. So, but but I think with the information that you have on this and the way that you have been staying with it, I would keep pushing it until my dying breath, because nobody else is. Well, we intend to do that, and I said mm-hmm. let's say before at least the conversation has moved away from James Earl Ray. So I know my time is short, and one minute and twenty four seconds. One minute and twenty four seconds. Okay. Well, anyhow, uh, let me just say this: that what I expect to. Talk a little bit about next time at the Black Power Hours. Number one is about um, just risk of material where they're saying that China intends to send at least 300 million people to Africa to infiltrate the, con- the continent. And this is not about, from my perspective, goodwill. It's about another form of colonialism. And the other piece that I want to touch on, um, the international piece, is this whole thing with, with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle and them 
spending part of their time in the UK or the other in Canada and how what's not being talked about but a lot of that has to do with racism folks don't want to acknowledge that but that's the real deal Miss Michael she's quote unquote biracial but what folks are looking at is the black side of her biracial so with that this is Sadiqi Kambon get ready to sign off here from the Black Power Hour here at Boston Praise Radio and TV with Pastor Bruce Wall and uh, if everything goes as I would hope I expect to be black next week thank you sir bless you The voice of the church in New England. The views and opinions expressed by the following paid program are those of the program producers and they do not reflect the views and opinion of Boston Praise Radio, its staff, or management. You can hear us on Audio Now, which is radio by phone. Just dial 712-770-7534. That's 712-770-7534. And you will hear us live on your telephone. Hi, this is Mike D. of the UA7 Gospel Countdown, Urban America's seven biggest current songs and more. Join us in fellowship with our broadcast on www.bostonpraiseradio.tv, Roku TV, WRCA 1330 AM Radio, and WBPG 102.9 FM Radio. These TV and radio networks are all coming out of Boston. Radio and TV that cares about Boston and beyond. This is your sincerely Mike D of the UA7 Gospel Countdown. Tune in and be blessed. This is Renee Wise, station manager for the Boston Praise Radio and TV Network of 30 radio, TV, social media, and internet stations. You can broadcast on our network by just giving me a call, 617-282-0685. 617-282-0685. Just a woman Help me believe And what I could be And all that I am Show me the stairway That I have to climb Lord, for my sake Teach me to take One day at a time One day at a time Sweet Jesus That's all I'm asking of you Just give me the strength To do every day What I have to do Yesterday Jesus, you know if you're looking below that it's worse now than then. 
To Bruce Wall. No telephone calls, please. We're not here today, but the gospel music and the praise is still going forward.
Father God, we acknowledge your presence here in this place. For you have promised to be wherever your people gather in your name to worship you. Times of refreshing here in your presence. No greater be there if ever I fall, if ever I fall, but it is better to know that I don't have to fall at all, I, I don't, don't have, have to fall at all, oh no, he's giving me power, all power, all power, power. well I've got power yeah. to stand, yeah. I power, all power, all power, well I've got power to stand, he's giving me all right, Vanessa, Mike, y'all got the same thing. I need the lyric. I need you to sing like a lyric. You give it, give it need pop. power. And Carvin, Carvin, your falsetto was a tad flat, so I need it. I'm having problems. You're on the top. Ronald, 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 Ronald. Why are you so inspired and your mouth is open, okay? Why don't you do the last riff on and, and give it power. Give me some power. I need power. All right now. You decide you need power. Oh, now see, I hate y'all that got me started before the concert tonight. I'm telling you, Bernie. Man, look at all these empty seats. Don't sweat it, Carver. We sold out tonight, man. In less than three hours, all those seats will be filled. Yeah, and all those spirits will be waiting to be lifted, too. That's a mighty big responsibility, Mike. Well, it's a mighty big guy we're working for. Hey, I know that's right. Ho! Oh! Miss Armstrong. Oh, God. They like you in the wardrobe oh. now, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> ah, look, I'm on my way. Right, but now, you. don't y'all get too happy out here, okay? Don't worry, Vanessa. The concert is not till eight. Yeah, but can the Holy Ghost wait till eight? Yeah! Hey, hey, hey. Oh, that's. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a lot, baby. Hi, this is Pastor Bruce Wall. How does a community-based nonprofit radio and TV station survive and thrive in this economy? Well, we have fundraisers. 
Join us each Wednesday at 12 noon as we host a 30-minute fundraiser to bring in the needed revenue that is needed to continue the growth of Boston Page Radio and TV. Number one, we want to start our news and sports segment. Number two, we want to hire a host talk master. Number three, we want to bring more local broadcasters on the air. This can only happen if each month we bring in the much needed finances to the station. When you partner with us by making a monthly donation to the station, we will grow. And don't forget, your donation is tax deductible. Why not donate right now? One, go to our website at www.bostonpraiseradio.tv www.bostonpraiseradio.tv and click on the donation menu. Number two, send us a donation by sending your check to Boston Praise Radio and TV at 670 Washington Street, Dorchester, Mass, zip code 02124. That's 670 Washington Street, Dorchester, Mass, zip code 02124. Or call us at 617 617- 282-0685. That's 617-282-0685. And schedule a time to come into the station and we will set up a day and a time for you to come into the studio to make your donation and to tour our facilities. Thank you for partnering with us and supporting Boston Praise Radio and TV with your monthly donation. There is no, 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 Still no Now the question is Will I do get will let the answer is yes 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 Yeah 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 I was at home one night the Lord asked me what I do get will I told him yes I said yes 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 yeah 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 so Lord I know I'm not much but I'm presenting my body a living sacrifice and all I am 